Hello and welcome. Today I'm pleased to be joined by a panel from the Woodley Maps community. In the interest of time, I'll skip introductions from the panel. We'll include links in the description if anybody wants to reach out. But in short order, we have with us today, David Anderson, Kevin Brennan, Chris Daniel, Prasanna Krishnamuthi, uh, and Jackie, T Dr. Jackie Taylor. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our guest, Mike Baxter. Uh, Mike has a PhD in science, a personal professorship, and has been awarded um, a chartered designer status. Mark is, Mike is also founder of Goal Atlas and the author of a new book, the strategy manual. So at this point, I should hand over to Mike to introduce himself and perhaps outline the context and the motivation for writing a book about strategy. Sure, thank you, John. Um, I'm delighted to meet everybody. Always very keen to uh, catch up with fellow mappers of various sorts. Um, so the main issue topic I think today is probably prompted by a conversation that John and I had in a different forum about the nature of mapping and how um, having looked at Wardley mapping and looked at another bunch of different types of mapping philosophies or methodologies if you like um, I briefly mentioned the one that I've been using uh, now for approximately 25 years um, and it was, I think, new to you, John. I'm not sure whether you had come across this approach before. So I want to get to there in reasonably short order so we can start talking about mapping. But just as context, um, I've been a consultant for a very long time. I do various uh, digital transformation uh, projects with uh, mostly big uh, multinational clients. So I've gone across a whole bunch of the tech sector so Google, Skype, Sony PlayStation, um, some financial services, and one that I'll talk specifically about is HSBC, because I did a big mapping project with them. Uh, university sector, um, I'm currently, I think probably in furlough, although not technically in furlough, in abeyance um, due to the COVID problem in a big mapping project with one of the UK's universities. Um, so I've done a lot of this work on strategy, uh, digital transformation, marketing and sales strategy, operational strategies, uh, quite a wide mix and with quite a wide mix of different clients. I also work with uh, startups. So typically high growth tech startups. Um, <clears throat> and the one that I'm currently working with is Ometria, O-M-E-T-R-I-A, Ometria.com. And they are a artificial intelligence system that personalizes emails to go from e-commerce retailers to their customers. So it will analyze the shopping patterns, the purchase patterns, of customers and it will personalize emails to them. So throughout all of that, that gave me what I felt was a reasonably broad view of strategy across multiple sectors and looking at it from a variety of different ways. And I decided that there was a lack in this world. And it's a bit hard to say that there's a lack of any kind of strategy book in this world because um, there's a one shelf of them behind me and there's many more shelves and many more bookshops. So why on earth did I think that a strategy book was a good idea? So the thing that I thought was missing was a, a workshop manual on actually how to do it. Um, that if you read Michael Porter's stuff, you know, inspiring, brilliant stuff on competitors. But of course, that's a perspective on strategy. That is not the totality of strategy. And it's a very valuable perspective, but it's not the only perspective. If you read Gary Hamo, you will get the sort of internal capabilities and increasingly human focused approach to strategy. And that's great, but please don't forget about competitors. So, you know, lots of these perspectives were really useful, but I wanted to try and write a manual that would be like a workshop manual. How do you start? You know, where, where is the, the starting point in writing a strategy? What do you do once you've written it? Where does strategy adaptation start? 
what is the difference between strategy and strategic planning? How do you manage value propositions within strategy? So there are all sorts of questions like that that I wanted practical, methodical answers to because that's just the kind of approach I take to most of these issues. My background, incidentally, is as a scientist, so I kind of take a scientist pr perspective to all of these things. So that's general background to strategy and the strategy manual. It is intended to be a manual for how to do strategy. It goes right across the entire strategy life cycle from the inception of strategy all the way through to the teardown of strategy and the reinvention in a new strategy. So it is intended to be full life cycle. Now, as part of that, so if there are any questions or comments or anything about that sort of general background, then I'm happy to take, just jump in at any point. Um, but let me get to the mapping part. So the mapping part starts a long time before I was involved in strategy. So prior to this consultancy career that I had, I was a product designer. And in fact, I wrote the, my product design book, um, which is kind of the workshop manual for product design. Um, so I wrote that in 1995. And included in that, I included, I discussed a technique that I used a great deal in product design which was function analysis. So function analysis originates in the 1940s with Larry Miles, who worked at General Electric at a time when there was huge demand for General Electric's products, but there were huge material shortages post-war. So rather than specifying, he was in the purchasing department, rather than specifying the things that he wanted to buy, he specified the functionality that he wanted them to have. So rather than ordering a box of nuts and bolts, he would say, I would like you to tender for a fastening mechanism to attach sheet to steel uh, structural components, for example. And then the suppliers could be innovative. They could supply him or offer to supply him a box of nuts and bolts if they wanted to. But in order to specify this sort of functionality that he wanted, he needed um, a language to describe function. And he came up with function analysis, um, which was then refined into what is currently the sort of uh, main model for function analysis. And value engineering, value analysis, function analysis, function engineering, these are all disciplines that are pretty well established across the world, particularly value engineering and value analysis. There are professional societies in most developed countries that just have whole teams of engineers that uh, comprise this professional society focusing on value analysis. So very well established technique. Not, as far as I can tell, applied to strategy. And that was where, so I was using it in product design, loved it in product design, started coming up with problems in strategy that I felt in the back of my mind, this is kind of sounding a bit similar. And I, I, it took me about nine months to make the connection between the problems I was experiencing in strategy and the solution that I had previously used a lot in product design. And it suddenly went click. And I thought, oh, this is actually the same kind of problem. So yes, Jackie. Yeah, if you don't mind, because I'm an aerospace engineer, so I'm completely with you, got Excellent. the same background. Um, so, so explain to me, just before you get into the, the connection, yes. what problems you, that, you were, that you were experiencing the strategy that you were able to correlate with what you knew from an engineering perspective? Yes, just okay. so I've got a context. Yes, okay. Um, so just to give you a, rel a relatively common example, um, we were approached and... Um, this is myself working with Sarah Edwards, my colleague in Goal Atlas. We were working previously in a company called eConsultancy, which is a sort of digital marketing specialist uh, based in London mostly. So we were approached by Sony PlayStation and they said, we have a consultancy project that we want you to help us solve. And the consultancy project they, they said they wanted was not what they actually wanted at all. And this is a very common thing if you're in the consultancy business. Client comes along and says they want A, and they actually want B. But you, of course, you can't tell them you don't want A, you want B. You have to do, you have to take them on a journey. 
So the problem that they said they wanted was they wanted to work out how to personalize the customer experience for players. And in particular, they wanted to do some really simple stuff. If I'm a five-year-old playing teddy bear games with my mom, please don't show me adverts for shoot 'em up one-person shooter games. So there were some quite simple things they needed to do, but they also wanted to personalize. Now it turned out that that was a relatively straightforward problem for them to solve with the technology that they were in the process of purchasing. The real problem was how they managed the staff behind the scenes creating and labeling the assets that would then be deployed on a personalized basis to different people. It wasn't really a consumer problem. Ultimately, it was, but we had to solve the staff behind the scenes problem first, and that was the more problematic issue. So how to do that? Yes. So that to me sounds like the classic bill of materials problem where you've got core components that are used in sub-assemblies, say, um, and then when it gets to assembly level, they use it in different routes. And you've got to be able to manage all of that, not over-provision all of that stuff. Is that what you're saying? So what I was effectively doing with them was I would go to them and say, okay, so you want to understand how best to manage um, the customer experience and to personalize the customer experience. Why do you want to do that? Why do you want to do that? Why do you want to do that? So classic moving up a function tree mm -hmm. and then yeah. coming back down the function tree and say, well, how are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? The Got thing that. they thought yeah. they were stuck with was the how of getting an established bunch of assets deployed to customers. That's a relatively straightforward problem. If you've got the assets, you've got the metadata, and you've got the algorithms that read the yes. metadata and deploy the assets. So by going up several stages of whys and back down several stages of hows in classic mm -hmm. function analysis type methodologies, I was yes. able to demonstrate to them a structured, systematic, logically validated function map. It wasn't a function map. Now we're talking strategy map, but a map of the whys and hows of the issue they were struggling with and move their attention from where they thought the problem was to where we eventually agreed the problem was. So okay. how familiar is anybody else familiar with uh, the, uh, the function analysis we're talking about? Or will I quickly run through that? I, I'd be interested to hear how you do it. So my right. background is in business analysis. And from your description, that sounds I it sounds like business analysis professionals are doing exactly what you were doing there, yeah. right? That kind of work. Um, so, but I don't know if I'm seeing your particular approach to it or okay. not. If that, fine. so uh, a very quick, if you can do that very quickly, that yeah. would be helpful. Okay, fine. So it's probably simplest to start with a, a mechanical example, just so that we get the logic right. So the one that I used in my product design book was a corkscrew. And in fact, I'll just show you so that you know what kind of corkscrew we're talking about. It's this kind of corkscrew, you know, with a uh, levering arms. Um, yep. So here, for example, um, the primary function of the corkscrew was to extract cork. So how are we going to do that? We're going to apply force and we're going to grip the cork. How are we going to apply force? We're going to provide attachment to the screw. We're going to provide mechanical advantage by means of handles, a rack and pinion, and a brace. So you kind of get vaguely the idea that we've got hows and whys in a mechanical arrangement. Now, if you okay. just... Okay, yeah, I got, I got it. I don't know if... It... That is what I would call functional decomposition. It's just, yeah. just basically the same technique. Yes. So I'm comfortable. I don't know if other people want more detail, but I, I now know, I now fully understand what you're getting at. Okay. So if we move it into a strategic example, and I'll keep it relatively specific to begin with, that if we said that we wanted to sell our products, then we might have to make sure that, well, how are we, if, if sell products was the primary purpose, it's clearly not going to be because making profit will be higher up, but let's, let's start there. We want to sell some products. So how are we going to do that? Well, we need to reach customers. We need to engage customers. We need to interest customers, and then we need to trigger their action of some sort. So we might go from 
selling products down to engaging customers. How are we going to engage customers? Well, there's a variety of ways we could do that. We could advertise to them. We could publish content and hopefully intrigue them sufficiently to click through to our website, at which point we, you know. So that's the kind of hows and whys that we can start decomposing, let's say, a marketing strategy. Now, where I think this gets really, really powerful is where you start getting to the point of validation. And this is something that, I mean, just to be perfectly clear, I am not suggesting that this basic use of why, how logic um, is unique or distinctive in the world and is limited to what I call strategy mapping. It's clearly not. It's used a lot. What I think is valuable, though, is where you start taking some of the particulars of function analysis, so particularly looking at the why, how logic, and in, in specifically using it to the point of validating a strategy map. So to validate a strategy map, I've got my why, how decomposition. Now at any node in that map, when I look at the sub goals underneath that node, they should be sufficient and necessary to deliver the parent. So in any map of a strategy map with this how, why, how logic, the set of children attached to a parent should be sufficient and necessary to deliver that parent. Now, when you start doing that across a much bigger strategy, it becomes hugely powerful because firstly, it cascades. So right down at the bottom, we have got people doing very, very tactical operational things. So a bunch of them should be sufficient and necessary to deliver their goal. This goal, and its sibling goals should be sufficient and necessary to deliver the goal above. And so on you go. So where you get to is you get to, and this is the work that I'm in the middle of doing uh, with one of the UK universities, trying to go from top to bottom of the entire organization via currently 15 separate strategies and trying to work out if they connect. Now, clearly they do connect, but do they connect systematically? And more importantly, do they validate? Because what will tend to happen is that it'll be a strategy in one part of the organization will refer to a goal that is actually a goal for some other part of the organization, but they call it a different thing or they label it differently, etc. So there's quite a lot of reconciliation and streamlining and analysis that you can do by simply talking about why, how logic, number one. Number two, the concept of validation, which then interconnects a whole bunch of similar related goals, hopefully serving a common purpose. So again, let me pause there and just see what comments people have got. Firstly, is the basic architecture making sense? You know, the, the why, how logic. Have I described enough of that? Because I can go into a lot more detail if you would like with that. Jackie. Me again. Um, just want to check in terms of the output. So let's take your uni example, because I think that's something we pro probably can all understand. If any of us have ever had any connection with a faculty, we'll know that that's quite difficult, that, that they within a faculty has a problem, uh, yes. never mind across the university. So the output of that, I mean, yes. I'm not saying it's finished, but when you finish that, you yes. get the result of it will be, I don't know. Okay. Um, so it's usually a very large and a very complicated map. So if I come back to HSBC, um, which is the piece of work I was doing about two years ago, they wanted to develop a strategy for moving to mobile and digital across their retail branch network. And they had identified there were a whole bunch of things that their customers needed to do. There was a whole bunch of things their retail staff needed to do. And there were a whole bunch of things that varying levels of head office needed to do. And they just needed to connect them all together. Now, it just so happened that within HSBC, there is a custom and practice of producing very large maps on the wall in the form of what they call train tracks. You know, it's vaguely similar to a London Underground map. So you start off with one or two quite uh, high level strategic goals on the left hand side. And then it branches and branches and branches out into varying colored tracks 
that are the responsibility of different people. So that was a tangible example of where we could produce a single visualization that would represent the breakdown of the tasks, the functional designation of the tasks, the sequencing of the tasks, and the interdependency of the tasks in this big picture. Now, I didn't think it was great, but HSBC absolutely loved it. And apparently it was in every head office wall um, soon after I finished working there. So, you know, it suited them. And that was one visualization. But I think there are much better ones. But Jackie, you wanted to come in. Yeah. So, so does that result then in each of those functions having a specific set of actions? And do you understand perhaps where the critical... Uh, points are within an organization and therefore where the collaboration and connection in an organization needs to be. Yes. Um, I'm coming at it that from, because I'm an engineer, but I am also the author of PRINT, the project management method. And the way oh, really? in which I constructed that thing is yeah. to understand how you would take that whole bill of material structure, which we're talking about here, and actually um, create it into its components, but but uh, do complex deliveries, but then understand the interdependencies and the critical path and all that. And it sounds like in your HSBC example and possibly in your university example, that what you would end up with is you would end up with an individual faculty having a subset, some of which delivers external to the faculty, some of which delivers internally, but everybody has a component part that delivers across the university. I'm just yes. checking I understand what you're saying. Yes. Yeah? Yes, so let's just start there. And I can give a very confident yes, that that is the case. And then there's a however <laughs> that has to go yeah, with it. Fine. So the however is that we have found with all the work that we've been doing with the strategy mapping, that it is essential to have one to many relationships going up as well as going down. So this is one to many whys as well as one to many hows. So you can imagine that if I'm wanting to, let's come back to, I want to sell my organization's products, there are going to be many whys. There are going, sorry, there are going to be many hows to that. I'm going to have to market it. I'm going to have to offer it for sale. I'm going to have to transact and I'm going to have to fulfill it. But there are also many, ha many whys as well. You know, one of the whys might be to make a profit for the company. Another might be to reduce carbon emissions because you want to sell this product as opposed to its less green predecessor. So there are many whys as well. So one of the things that is really valuable, and this is the key answer to your previous question. So a big train tracks map on a wall is not the ideal solution. The ideal solution is that everybody in the organization knows what their little cluster of nodes is, knows the multiple purposes they are serving, and that's where I think you get cross-functional relationships, mm -hmm. because in order to do my job, I don't just have to report to my boss. I also have to work mm -hmm. with IT. I also have to work with PR. Um, and I have to make sure that all three of these functions are happy that I'm achieving my goal in a way that meets all of their requirements, not just one. So having a, a, a strategy map that is richly mapped up the way as well as richly mapped down the way makes the map quite complex. And this is where in an IT solution is quite important because it no longer fits on a sheet of paper. Um, however, getting that relationship mapped out, I think is really vital because the most important thing is that I know what I'm doing and I know what my bit of the map is and to be able to parcel out these little pieces of map and expose the different bits of the map to the different people according to their connection within the, within the organization. That seems to be the key part. What I'd like to do now, if possible, is to explore how the process of mapping can run across an organization. So everybody can kind of become stakeholders in, in challenges that an organizing organization may face yeah so in, in chapter four of the book um and if i understand this correctly you yep. talk about the limitations of topological maps yes. and in particular the balance scorecard system yes. yes so i was wondering if you've got any insights on the the distinction between topographical 
and yeah. topological maps in yeah. strategy and the process okay. of mapping and how mapping in general can facilitate collaboration, situational awareness, and dealing with uncertainty. Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, good bunch of questions, John. Thank you. Um, so let's deal with the, the topological um, mapping to begin with. So the, the simplest example is, of course, the London Underground map. Or I imagine, for any of you not familiar with London Underground map, any underground map, um, because what tends to happen with a map of an, of an underground railway or metro system is that you take away lots of the detail. You know, if that uh, train track goes round a corner in physical space, you don't necessarily need to represent that corner on a map of the underground because you have no control over whether you go around the corner or not, you're taken around the corner. So it's, it's relatively straightforward to represent a rail track that might in real life zigzag all over London and you represent it in a straight line because that's all you need to know. You just need to know that I can get on at this station and I can get off at that one. So anyone who tries to use a London underground map to navigate a, across streets gets hideously lost because some stations look like they're quite close together and others look like they're very far apart and actually they're 100 yards apart. So that's a, an indication of a topological map. You simplify it. And in fact, um, I'm sure you're all capable of doing this as well, but I just happen to have it here. Um, so as Wikipedia says, topological map, a type of diagram that has been simplified so that only vital information remains and unnecessarily detail has been removed. So that's a topological map. And topological maps tend to be brilliant at the purpose for which they were designed. So the London Underground map is excellent for getting around by underground. It's not so good by, for getting around on foot or on bicycle. And the balanced scorecard strategy mapping, and for those of you who uh, aren't familiar with it, it goes through kind of four strata, four stratified layers, which I think are financial, customer, internal process, and then learning and development. And all strategic goals within the balanced scorecard system need to fall into one of those four. And the expectation is that the only way you're going to get financial gain is from the next layer down, which is the customer layer. So you have to do things to customers to have financial gain, which in the balanced scorecard card world is fine. But what if I'm a supply chain manager? Got nothing to do with customers. And I still want to improve the company's financial performance, but there isn't a layer for me. So the balanced scorecard system, as far as I can see, excludes supply chain managers. It's great if you're a marketer because there's a layer for customers. It's lousy for supply chain managers because there isn't a layer for suppliers. So in exactly the same way as London underground maps are no use for walking around London, they're really good for getting there by train, Similarly, balanced scorecard maps are very good if you're working in the balanced scorecard system. But woe we'll betide anybody who tries to do generic strategy mapping across an entire organization, including operations and supply chain, using balanced scorecard mapping. It doesn't work. It breaks. There are not the, the strata, the layers that enable you to put your stuff into the map. Now, I don't want to get too tied up in Wardley Maps because I'm definitely not an expert in Wardley Maps. I looked in some detail in Wardley Maps about five or six years ago to find out whether they did the job I wanted to do. And I concluded at that time that they didn't because they seem to be similarly topological. They seem to have some layers or some constraints on them that you know, the, the goals you put in were of a particular type and went in a particular place. Now, I don't want to dig too deep a hole for myself here because I am not an expert in world maps. What I would say though, however, is when you get back to strategy mapping using why, how logic, the thing that I love about it is that the why, how logic to me corresponds in geographical mapping terms to two things. So for a, to follow an ordnance survey map, I need two things. I need a compass and I need a scale. And why, how logic mapping for me has a compass, why and how, and it has a scale, the interval between two goals. 
between a goal and its sub-goal or between a goal and its parent goal. And that's all there is. There are no other constraints at all. You follow those rules and you say you must, from any goal, go either why am I doing it or how am I doing it? And you must have one-to-many branching, both up and down, and you must be able to validate. So all the hows should be sufficient to justify the goal above, and the whys should be sufficient to rationalize or explain why you're doing the goal below. And these are the only rules. So I don't know if that's kind of got to where you are hoping to get to, John, but topological maps seem to be constrained in a way that is very good for a particular purpose, but no good generally. The why-how logic appears to have only the constraints that are needed to do mapping, which is direction or orientation and scale. So does that kind of make sense? The, the bit I'm interested in is to around uncertainty, anything to do with that. So the, the why-how logic, mm -hmm. how can you deal with... Um, so Wadley mapping has the evolution access. Yeah. Yes. So you can make a some there's the the um, uncertainty principle that we know something will happen but we don't know when, yes. or we know when something will happen but we don't know how. Yes. So that's where the, the blindness is not. That's the wrong word to use, but that's the the issue that you have with mapping. But it's still helpful. And it's still useful. Yes. And it uh, it helps to some extent deal with uncertainty. Yes. What I'm not certain with with the why how logic and cascading um, values or cascading goals mm -hmm. is how uncertainty can reveal itself. Okay. Um, so it doesn't actually. It's more a process than a than a representational issue. Um, so the process that we would go through is let me come back to my. I want to sell some products, and I'm trying to work out how. So we start off with the obvious hows. You know, I must market them. I must actually transact and take money. But all the rest of the hows might be up for grabs. So it's a very powerful process to start asking how else, how else, and how else. So you've got some that are perhaps reasonably certain hows. So if I'm wanting to sell some products, I'm pretty certain that I need to transact. I need to be able to take an order, take money, and fulfill that order. So I don't think there's a great deal of uncertainty about that. How I market it, how I reach my customers, how I even decide who my customers are, I think we can then start gaming the candidate hows against one another. Now, how you do that is not a feature of strategy mapping, but identifying all the candidates all the candidate methods of achieving a higher goal and all the candidate purposes that you might serve by achieving that goal, that I think is a really powerful process. And it's a great one for workshopping with clients because you can start going through, here are the certain hows, here are the possible hows, and here are a whole bunch of possible hows. Now, what do we need to know to reduce the uncertainty related to these? Because at some point in time, strategically, you are going to need to bet on a course of action. And if you're going to delegate that through the organization, you do need that commitment. You maybe want to hold in reserve the fact that you have alternative hypotheses if that one doesn't work out. And you may decide at an early stage that I'm not going to pick this one. I'm going to set up a competition between two of them, and I'm going to perhaps split test them. So I don't know that I, I feel that there is an answer to your question about does strategy mapping represent uncertainty? No, I don't think it does. I think part of the value is that it gives clarity to certainty and it forces managers to make decisions about, okay, what are we going to go with now? Recognizing this might not be the right answer and recognizing we have a second possibility if that one goes wrong, I think there is value in forcing managers to make decisions that they then pass down through the organization. Or they share with their teams who are going to own the sub goals, the hows that we're trying to identify. And further on in the book, I go into quite a lot of detail 
about adoption conversations. So, you know, if you're my boss, I don't think it's your job to give me my goals. It's your job to explain to me what your goals are and to work with me to work out how I can best serve your goals and any other goals I need to serve for the organization in conversation between you and I. So we co-create the bit of the strategy map that I'm eventually going to take ownership of. And that I think is a critical part of the evolution of these. This is a not very good method for top-down command and control management. This is a very good method for participative and community focused goal decisions and goal setting. Yeah. Steve. Um, so I've, I'm noticing a bit of a crossover between KPIs and, and strategy mapping. Obviously they're not exactly the same. Um, no. Is that something that you've looked at and toyed around with? Yes. Um, so we are, um, and again, um, I can probably show you, I can certainly share some screenshots at some point of the software tool that we have been developing for quite some time um, in order to do all of this quite rich and complex mapping. Um, the key is that a goal, so any node within the strategy map is a goal. <clears throat> and it is only described by its, its label, if you like. And going right back to Jackie and I's sort of engineering type heritage with all of this, there was a suggestion that goals should be described with verb noun pairs. So what are you doing and what are you doing it to? Now, I think that's a little bit constricting because you often need a qualifier. You know, you need verb noun qualifier. I'm going to do this to that by means of or using or whatever. So we tend to say that a goal is limited to 60 characters because if you have more than 60 characters, you tend to be suggesting a compound goal. So something like, I am going to sell products in order to, or I'm going to sell products by means of, and that should actually be separated out into buys and hows. Okay, so we've got a goal and it's got a label. Then that goal has got a whole bunch of attributes. And one attribute is a target. One attribute is an owner. One attribute is a priority. And one cluster of attributes can be a conversation. So we can actually attach conversations to goals and that might explain, for example, where the goal came from or what the alternatives were before we decided on this particular goal. So to specifically answer your question, there is a set of attributes that we would tend to attach to each node. And some of these attributes will be a target value, a date, and a measure of progress towards that target attribute. So this little cluster will give you a progress report to say you're halfway through your time and you're two thirds of the way through your goal. So well done, you're ahead of, tra of track. So KPIs in my view are attributes of goals and it's really crucial to keep them the same. Never, ever, ever have a KPI as an attribute because if you say why a KPI or what, how a KPI, it breaks down. Why a goal and how a goal, that makes sense. Uh, if I can, so that sounds very similar to, although I know the relationship is the other way around, to what the, common, the current uh, trend towards objectives and key results measures. Yes. Um, but, you know, I know that OKRs are just a reinvention of that how why logic that has been standing around for a long time. So having, as I said, I, because I have background in business analysis, I, I actually led development of the business analysis body of knowledge. Um, I'm very familiar with the kind of the kind of logic you're setting out. And one of the things I, I came across when I started doing wardly mapping was I started trying to do it by functional decomposition. And I quickly found that didn't work at all. Okay, good. <laughs> um, wordly maps to me seem to be more about situational awareness. They are identifying the, you know, the key components of the, you know, the value that you're delivering, the user need, and understanding how those can evolve over time. 
right? So they, it's really kind of looking at, out at the market, seeing where evolution could occur, and then that may help you find places where you could drive evolution in order to change the market yourself, which is in a way very different from the kind of how, why logic as to what people should be doing, right? Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, I think that they're solving two different problems. Yes. Both of which are real, but, they, but they're about two different things. Yes. David, did you want to come in? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And probably on a, a similar point to, to Kevin there. I think it's a fascinating discussion. Um, one thing I think is interesting is about with, with the, the, the wordly strategy cycle. There's like the, the purpose, the mapping, and then the, the, the gameplay, et cetera, you know, what you do. Yeah. So where I found, and I work for a, a large enterprise of 50,000 people, and we use, and I think there are two slighter things, we use wordly mapping very early on to try and figure out, to get that kind of situational awareness, you know, and it's really when there's an unknown. And for me, it's the finished map is actually probably quite irrelevant. It's the purpose of drawing the map out and the components, yep. you know, because sometimes what the map does is, it, is sometimes it shows an evolution of something that we didn't really uh, foresee. Yep. And that's really the important part. So you might see a pattern or an emergence. Once you start to bring in that evolution, spot the inertia, you say, well, here's a possibility we never really thought of. Mm -hmm. um, do you know? So I think once you um, use it in that sense, after you, and we, we call them observations, we maybe see three or four observations coming out of a map. If there's an observation that you then decide to act on, I think that's where something like um, those organizational structures, what, what we use in our org is we use the North Star framework to effectively decompose goals, like uh, lagging measures down to leading measures yep. that we can execute on. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes we get into like event modeling or domain driven design to figure out how, but that very detailed strategy map or organizational map, I find comes much later in the cycle because yep. by that stage there's constraints and you're in the in execution mode. For me, the wordly earlier on when you're in that kind of, um, you know, gameplay, what should we do next, where, where it's, it's really helpful. So I, I do think, and I think I, I like the difference between the topological and topographical, but I think the wordly maps are actually something different yet again. Oh, really? Okay. So one of the reasons that I was so uh, pleased to jump on this call is that I have been around the block often enough to know that there is not one method that's right and another method that's wrong. So, you know, I was not here to persuade you that wordly mapping is a load of nonsense and you really ought to stop it and start doing my method. <laughs> that tends to not be a useful conversation. In exactly the same way, I would not argue the balanced scorecard is in any way, you know, wrong or misguided or misplaced. It's excellent at what it does. What I didn't know and what I'm really enjoying out of this conversation is I didn't know what was particularly good about wordly mapping and I'm, I'm beginning to get a bit of a feel for it now. So that's really useful. Thank you. Jackie, you wanted to come in? Yeah, so I think one of the things I use it for, I've, I've been pulling together the post-COVID plan for the United Nations, is to be able to do this at nation state level, where you've got different economies that are dependent on different sectors. And so I pick up particularly on what David just said about the set aware situation. I'm actually from counter-terrorism domain. So I, I live that world. Okay. <laughs> so situational awareness is a really good thing. I think this, I can see some synergies with what you're saying. Um, I think one of the things that I would say that Wardley Map particularly allows you to do is to understand the values of what you're driving in your organization, but also it exposes the culture. And culture is, a, is often a barrier or an enabler for innovation. Mm -hmm. And so it, and, and one of the things it does do is because of the way in which you actually do it, you know, the collaborative way in which you do it, often um, you can have a conversation with a worldly map that would be included in a fight, particularly in financial services. So I take your point about the HSBC one, a fight between departments. You know, if you ever try and put um, fraud um, in the same room as cyber, you will end up with a war. <laughs> Whereas with a modeling map, you can do that um, from uh, understanding values and culture and understanding the opportunity that comes in. So I think there's some synergies with what you're saying the strategy mapping does and what we're doing. What I would say in the organizations that I'm with, well, in the nations I'm working with, that the two um, are, are convergent in some respects, 
but their their currency is around at particular event points. So the, the particular instance I was just talking about is we did a new global plan for the G20. So we mapped the, the G20 economies using modeling mapping. And then from that, we're able to look at nation state level, what the opportunities were and provide the focus for where you start. What would be your pri priorities in a post pandemic world? And so I think that it, it is situational awareness, but it actually allows the G20 members to do exactly the same thing in 20 completely different ways. And, but actually allow it to have a currency across economies that are completely different. And I suppose what I think Wardley Mapping does is actually um, takes account of the externalities on, on your operating models and particularly your business models. Those are all blown in a, in a post pandemic world. So what do you need to do? And so I think that getting that, that overall overarching piece on a regular basis, because these are getting refreshed every three months, then um, that is what it contributes. But I can see how what you're talking about has an ability to then translate that through to the, and how does that actually change the way, literally the way our culture works, because a goal-driven organization is a totally different one, especially if you attack the label financial services, those two are usually oxymorons. So I, I think for me, what you're saying, that's how it sounds. I just wanted to spend check that really. Yes, sure. David, did you want to come in? No, no. Yeah, just, sorry, just very quickly. There was a great, there's a great thing I remember seeing in a, I think it was a Pixar book. Pixar was talking about the ugly baby in the machine. Mm -hmm. The ugly baby are ideas that you can challenge, you can discuss. And in a corporate environment, sometimes it's very hard to challenge things because you're challenging my thing. Once you get into the machine execution, this is what we do. So I think as Jackie was saying, the thing that I like about Wardley Maps is they open, they ask for challenge. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they enable challenge and you're challenging the map, the idea, you're not challenging the person. Yes, that's the thing. That's, yes, that's, that's really thing. important. So I can sit with a bunch of my peers and we can challenge each other's thinking in a safe space. Once you get into like an org chart, and I, I, I think your stuff is really solid. Once you get into that kind of map of how do we explain how this works, it's, it's often harder to challenge that. Do you know what I mean? It's like, this is our plan for the next quarter. Sometimes it's very difficult to challenge that for, from within the organization. So with that, the thing that's nice about the Wardley Maps is the, 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 the ask for challenge effectively. Steve? No. Yeah, so just, uh, well, two points. One on challenge. Um, one thing I really love is uh, Dave Snowden's, uh, he's got a workshop um, for this. I'm trying to remember the, the uh, ritual descent is what it's called. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the general idea is it, you build challenge in, um, and he's been successful in having chief executives and very new junior staff. Uh, the chief execs being challenged by the junior staff using this approach. Right, yeah. so it's uh, quite a cool approach. Um, so I was going to ask actually if you've got an example because um, with everything that you've talked about, um, I'm just trying to visualize what one of these maps would look like, and I'm seeing kind of like a network diagram of you know, this kind of thing together. Um, you know based on either hierarchy or these the these actual um these two key attributes right so 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 the links uh, between them um, i was wondering if, if you've got a, a an example of that yeah sure i will pull it up in just a moment um Asana, did you want to come in yeah so i think uh, you know I, i'm just listening to everybody here right and i was trying to see how we do the process and i think uh, you know we, we follow something very close to what david said I work with very early stage startups. So most of the time, uh, the issue is, uh, you know, you're completely working on the wrong thing. Mm. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, something that is, uh, you know, five degrees away or, you know, five steps away or, uh, you know, just sell it to the person sitting on the next desk uh, mm. might make you literally millions of dollars more uh, than what you're trying to do. And it, it's, it's a complete lack of situational awareness in terms of, you know, are you even in the selling to the right person? Are you even uh, selling it the right way? Are you even selling the right thing, right? And uh, given that uh, I work primarily in software and so with software companies, you, you can do literally anything, right? I mean, uh, there's no constraint on what you can build uh, or how you can solve it. I mean, almost all problems are solvable today. Um, uh, with, with all respect to Dr. Jackie, <laughs> you're working with nation states. I, I'm working with like tiny software companies. So, you know, all, all problems are solvable in my domain, right? So, so I, I think where the uh, thing comes in is, um, 
you know, when before we get to, hey, uh, you know, uh, the how we should do this, and I think what Simon called, calls the why of movement, I think the why of purpose, which is what the hell are we doing? Like, why the hell are we doing this? Who, the, who are we doing this for? Uh, is something that um, is also very closely attached to timing, right? Uh, web van in uh, 2000 with 800 million dollars was very very wrong uh, nothing wrong in what they did but you know they needed to do it in 2020 not in 2000 right yeah uh, so uh, any future historian will write that they were incredibly uh, prescient in uh, what they did but you know having the timing wrong is just as just the same as being wrong right uh, so I think that uh, sense of figuring out what is the right timing and that sense of figuring out, you know, who am I working with? So to me, when I look at the Wadley map, when I look at a map that we draw, I see people there, right? These are all functions that are being done by people. So I don't see it as a map of things that are getting done as much as a map of people that could be working together to get something done for the anchor, Right? Mm -hmm. because the anchor is the end user yeah. and and then different people in those are literally differing living in different times if you will so we have uh, potentially somebody in uh, san francisco living in a 2020 uh, but somebody you know 100 kilometers from me in bangalore right now might be living in 1850 right mm -hmm. uh, from a technological uh, capacity if you will and i'm sure with uh, dr jackie is saying that as well across their technological mm -hmm. capabilities right yeah. So that uh, suddenly starts putting the founders that I work with in a bit of a spot because in many cases, the founders that I work with are really ahead of market, uh, but being ahead of market is the same as being wrong. So you have to use your capability of being ahead of market to deliver something that the market wants today, because otherwise you're not going to make any money, right? Mm. And I have not, like, if we freeze things too much, then you, we lose that sense of uh, you know uh, play in terms of you know I think what uh, you know Steve was just talking about in terms of like if, if you just freeze things too much then you can't question them anymore and then we are like already into the OKR side of things or the you know the results in the we're talking the KPIs and stuff like that and then that is a like already uh, you're you're in the in the lagging metric so to speak and then you can't make any changes there right you're in the solution domain uh, but the, uh, the power of, uh, you know, having the time element to it and the power of, I mean, looking at it as a landscape of uh, people that you are essentially working with or working for or, uh, you know, competing with or uh, complementing, right? I think that has been like superbly powerful outside of the organization that we work in or mm -hmm. outside of that startup and in relationship to everything else that's there in the world. That's how... You know, the, I found, uh, you know, Wadley Maps, the, the mapping exercise to be very powerful because, you know, uh, somebody sees X as a partner, somebody else sees X as a competitor, somebody else sees X as a customer, somebody else sees within the same organization and they might be outside. So which role are you working with them in? Those are the kind of things that I think, um, you know, have been really powerful. And then once that's kind of frozen and we are like kind of all aligned on that, then the uh, we many of the startups that we work with use the OKR framing or whatever, or the North Star kind of a framing to go, you know, hey, we're, let's all make sure we are all rowing in the same direction, right? Sure. And then are we going in the same direction and then break that down? And that's where I think what you're saying in terms of uh, one of the things that I got was like, ask the how and the why when you're going up and down that chain af after fixing the North Star could be like very powerful. Uh, sure. So just a few comments on everything that people have been saying. Firstly, I've been in raging agreement with all of you um, and thinking that this is the, exactly the kind of stuff that I have been doing with my clients with uh, strategy mapping. So, you know, just because it, it has an engineering heritage and it's built on this really quite formal why, how logic that does actually logically validate does not mean it's fixed. You know, it is not fixed it should be the most fluid thing that you can imagine. So just to give two examples of that, uh, the first generic one is that I am adamant that strategy is different from strategic planning. Uh, 
So you think of what is the North Star and you identify that. My preference is to identify that North Star, to identify the value of getting there and the core methods by which you're going to get there. Not the detailed methods, but the core methods, the handful of core methods to get there. So that to me is strategy. Strategic planning is how you're going to do it. That's the transformational plan. As soon as you have fixed draft one of the strategic plan, it starts changing because it is designed to change. The North Star does not, but the strategic plan changes. So this strategy map should be the most fluid thing in the organization. And every single person that owns a node in that organization needs to know the freedom they have to either change the node they own, the purposes they're serving, or the methods that they're using. Now, in most organizations, you only have the authority to change the methods that you're using. You tend not to have authority to change the purposes you're serving. That tends to be done in a sort of command and control way. Whether it ought to or not is a different matter, but it tends to be. So firstly, I would say that it really, really has to be a very, very fluid system. But having simple rules like why how logic must continue to validate actually permits freedom. You know, if you know what the rules are, as long as you stick to the rules, you can do whatever you like. So that's one thing I wanted to say. The second thing was that um, we managed to negotiate in a project I did probably three or four years ago, which was heading for the biggest train crash you can imagine. Uh, Cisco, the big technology company, decided for one of their areas, one of their regions, that they were going to take a sales department and a marketing department and create one. Now, that was culturally incredibly difficult. And they decided, I persuaded them to use strategy mapping to work that through. And that was what I imagine you are doing with Wardley mapping. Lots of stakeholder interviews, lots of trying to find out where all the vested interests were, lots of identification of where the uncertainties lay, what we could be confident about, were we heading in the right direction, you know, all of these things from which I constructed a draft strategy map and then we threw darts at it and put post-it notes on it. And we workshopped it for two days with the sales team and the marketing team, both in the room at the same time, and found that there were two big, big areas of disagreement. One was about their implementation of Salesforce. So it was a technological issue. And the other was incentives management. So, you know, that big map resolved down to two hotspots that we had to resolve. And I am imagining from what you're saying about Wardley mapping, you know, you would have a similar sort of situational awareness, a similar sort of cultural journey that you take people on. So I just wanted to say that please don't think that the strategy mapping that I'm talking about doesn't allow you to do that stuff because I think it does. Maybe not as well as Wardley mapping. I don't have a view on that. <laughs> well, that, that's... Uh... I think it's, um, it makes sense to me. And the other point I want to make, unfortunately, is we're coming to the end of the hour. Yes, I realize. So I thought the best thing I can do really is to give the floor back to Mike for any message that you'd like to give or share with the Wardley Mapping community and perhaps what your focus is over the next 12 months. Sure. Um, so the first thing is that if any of you want to, I realize that I haven't come back to you, Steve, and pulled up an example. I think we've run out of time. If you want to message me directly, I'm, I'm sure we can have a separate chat. But um, John, I shared with you a three minute video that I had produced that summarized strategy mapping. So if anyone wants to just sort of get the distilled essence of it, then have a look at that video. And of course, if you have any questions, then let me know. Um, and secondly, where I'm going with this, um, what I'm currently involved with now is trying to take the practicalities of what I've produced in the book and turn them into workshop sessions, which in the current climate, sadly, are all going to be online, but hopefully that won't last for too long. So producing these workshop sessions makes it much more immersive 
to actually do some of this strategy mapping and to make it applied to your own world. So I would be happy, John, I can probably just share with you and you can share as appropriate. So the first of these workshops we're going to be launching in about 10 days time and it's about the essence of strategy. But I think if you look at that, uh, it'll be another sort of six minute video introducing the workshops. But I think if you look at that with a view to strategy mapping, I think you'll probably get a flavor of where I'm going with that. So producing lots and lots of resources, uh, lots of models, all of the models in the book we are giving away in Creative Commons. So we're releasing them as and when we can. So goalatlas.com slash models. If you want to sign up to get these free models, um, you'd be very welcome to do so. Uh, lovely to talk to you all. Uh, really appreciate you giving me a glimpse into your world of worldly mapping. I will look at it again in light of your comments because I think there are some things that I hadn't given due attention to. So thank you very much for that. Much appreciate your time. Glad you're interested in strategy mapping. And John, thanks so much for setting it up. Well, I'd like to, to thank all the panelists for sharing or, uh, their time today. Uh, I'd like to thank Sarah for linking me with Mike and a big thank you to Mike for this hour. Um, I've got a lot to catch up on and get back to the book, the, the strategy manual and do send me those links so we can share those as well. Yeah. Okay. Bye then. Great. Brilliant. Thank uh, you. Thanks again. Thank Mike. you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.